The reading today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Um, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who we in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is God's word. Well, good evening, everyone. If you have a Bible, please do uh, open it up on the screen or in print to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to highlight just a a couple of things from this passage this evening. And if you weren't here last week and if you haven't heard, I do encourage you to go online and listen to Stephen's opening uh, wonderful sermon on this. Yesterday, my son Nathaniel uh, landed in New Zealand where he's gone for um, part of a gap year. And uh, I'd visited New Zealand about uh, 10 years ago on a sort of teaching trip. And my Nat was about 13 then, um, the son of what he thought was a pretty uncool dad, uncool vicar. And uh, he said, Dad, New Zealand's the place to get a tattoo. Um, And I thought about it, but the expense and the pain um, over what, you know, sort of won the argument. And I I didn't come back with one, much to his disappointment. And um, I wonder if he's going to come back with one. (laughs) I'm not sure what I think. Back in about 1985, I self tattooed myself with the name of my beloved at the time. She was called Liz, and I married a Tiffany. And uh, I wondered about reworking. So uh, tattoos and me, I'm not sure. But if I, I had it removed at great expense. But if I was to have a tattoo today, I've often thought that I'd go Latin, because I've been in Oxford a long time. And it would be Benedictus Benedicat. Let the blessed one bless. Some of you will recognize that. That's part of a prayer that's said at formal Oxford College dinners when they go all posh and say a bit of Latin. Benedictus benedicat, let the blessed one bless. It can mean let the blessed one God bless this food or the one who's been blessed by this food bless God. But if I had to come up with a tattoo or if I had to come up with a title for this passage, it would be Benedictus benedicat. Let the blessed one bless, and the one who's been blessed, bless him. Ephesians 1 is actually one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. There uh, are about 1,200 chapters, but I, I return to this one often because it just helps get me through. And life's often not easy, but when I come to this chapter, I gain perspective And it's almost like a sort of portal to to heaven. And a bit of heaven breaks into my life. A bit of light will come into the rainy grayness that is there at times. And perspective comes. I believe that if we could only grasp the truths that we read here, that are contained here, our lives would be 
transformed and we'd sleep better and we'd feel better and we'd live better and we'd act better and we'd do better and our lives would feel less anxious and less restless and less driven and less insecure, more in awe and less eeyore, a nickname my wife uses for me at times. Verse 3 is really the, the heading, the title for the next few verses up to verse 14. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And last week, Stephen uh, brilliantly opened this up, every spiritual blessing, ESB. And uh, I don't know if you were here, but he encouraged us to write after our name, you know, on job applications and academic forms, you know, like degrees, instead of a BA, ESB, every spiritual blessing, and to put it on our letters at the end of emails and to send it out. I don't know if you did that this week. I received a number. In fact, I received two from America, ESBing me. But I'm a bit of a sad vicar, and I uh, at the end of one of the services, I was out there and someone came out and said, how are you feeling? Having had this sermon on this passage, I said, medium. And they went, no, you are ESB. <laughs> and I felt duly challenged by that. But we are the ESB and we're going to think a bit more about that this evening. God is not out to get us. God is out to bless us. And we are blessed by God, you are blessed by God. But the fact is that often we struggle to believe that. Often we get into a kind of comparison with others and we look at them and we look at their lives and we think, well, they're blessed. And we feel that we've somehow missed out on that. Some of us actually have misconstrued what God is like and we think of him more as a kind of traffic speed camera ready to just snap a photo if we, if we just go over the limit a bit and then we're going to get some intimidating and uh, incriminating letter telling us that we have got a fine. Anyone ever experienced that? I don't see any hands. Let's have... Yeah, I have. That's it. Some of the time we're dis disappointed with God. We feel that we've waited and we've asked and we've prayed and we haven't got what we thought was our due and what we wanted. Perhaps some of us feel even unworthy because of things in our life that we've thought or said and done and think maybe can't, God can't bless us. But this passage in Ephesians 1, as, we, as we've heard read, tells us that God has blessed us already. He's not out to get us. He's out to bless us. This year we're encouraging everyone to have a go at reading through the Bible in a year. Maybe get the Bible in one year app. And the fact is wherever you cut scripture, wherever you open it up, it's as if it's water franked on that page that God is out to bless us. The very first act of God towards humankind was to bless them. We made Adam and Eve, it says, and God blessed them and said. The very last sentence of scripture is a blessing. God speaking this blessing over the world. And God is a blessing God. And Jesus puts a human face on God. And he comes blessing. There's a wonderful drawing by Raphael, the Renaissance artist. And it's just a line drawing of Jesus. And Jesus is there, reaching out his arm, blessing us. Jesus came blessing. And everything he said and everything he did was in order to bless us and align us with God's blessing. He was born to bless, and of course he died in order to bless. And I love that line in the prayer of communion where the minister says, he opened wide his arms of love upon the cross, wide, wide as the ocean, embracing the world and wanting to bless them. And scripture tells us that when Jesus left and ascended into heaven, it says he lifted up his arms and he blessed them. And then the angel said, why are you looking up? He will come back even as he went. He left blessing. He's preparing a blessing. He's coming back. 
with a blessing. I want you to understand, saints, what God is like. He is the God who blesses. And we see that he's a God who blesses us spiritually. That's what Paul says. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every, every means all that there is. God doesn't hold out on us. He doesn't keep stuff back for himself. He doesn't say you're not going to get some of that only if you're really good and achieve X, Y, Z. Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus and has been purchased for us and laid up for us, already ours. And it's spiritual. We think of blessings sometimes uh, and we get disappointed because we think of it in terms of the material or the physical uh, or the temporal, but these are eternal things. God doesn't promise material, physical and temporal blessings per se, but spiritual ones laid up for us in heaven. Not that they don't cash out in a very practical and tangible way in our life. We've just heard an amazing testimony of someone who's experienced spiritual blessings. They've encountered God. They've become a Christian. They've been transformed. And they testify to feeling and knowing forgiveness. That's a spiritual blessing, but it has an immediate resonance and connection and impact and a transformation of a life here and now. It's not just pie in the sky. It's a spiritual blessing in heavenly realms, forgiveness and freedom and fulfillment and redemption and reconciliation with God. But right here and now, we can enjoy it and others can benefit from it. It's spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. And then Paul says that God has blessed us lavishly. In verse seven and eight, he talks about the riches of his grace that he's lavished upon us. I love that word, lavish. It's a kind of eating word. Sometimes in the week, I go to a great takeaway on St. Alday, it's called Kokoro. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a sort of Korean Japanese. And their chicken katsu curry is absolutely wonderful. But it, I, I've realized over the last few months that some of the staff have a different kind of ethic and ethos when it comes to portion management. <laughs> so I always buy I always buy the regular. You can either have medium or regular. And I feel, even though I, I like the word medium, regular seems more appropriate. So I go for regular, which is really a large. But then when, when some of them serve it, it feels like I've only got a medium. And I feel like saying I paid regular, I've only got medium. And, I wonder, and then there are others, and they just pile it on, and I see that they put it in, and then they almost press it down, make a bit of space, and whack a bit more on. And I think, yes! This is the person I want to serve me. And sometimes, if the two of them are there serving, I wait around. I just, I meditate, I pray, and I think, ah, now I'm next, and hi. And they say, hi. And uh, I always say, can I have some curry sauce on the rice before the chicken and more curry sauce? And they say, of course. And it's a beautiful thing. But that's what I think of with lavish. Lavish isn't portion management. Lavish doesn't hold back. You know, there are no pipettes in heaven. <laughs> there, do you know what I mean? You know, how much do you want with that? A dessert spoon size or what? No, I want a ladle. When I read lavish, I think ladle. In fact, the word lavish in Greek, perisuo, means an excessive amount. What a great word that is. Excessive amount and it was used of a river that broke its banks God doesn't just dispense his blessings to us with a pipette you get it's like an ocean it's a river we, we've had a flood the last ten days and I live in Osney Island all flooded some of you in Dan Abingdon you've seen it and God's blessings overflow to us God is not screwed Scripture tells us that he's got an inheritance for us. What's that like, an inheritance? I sometimes go and visit my dear old dad, and, um, you know, he's a sort of slightly obsessive 
collector or hoarder, you might call it. And uh, he thinks these things are wonderful. I think some of it's tat. And uh, he says to me, so he shows me an old pot or an old coin. And he says, one day, son, this will all be yours. <laughs> you know? And that line from Monty Python, what, the curtains? You know, <laughs> not the curtains. And I feel like saying, Dad, I don't want any of it. I re- Go on, flog it, or cash in the attic, or, you know, it's just get rid of it. And I've got to be honest, it sounds cruel, but sometimes I think, what shall I buy my dad for birthday? It was in December. Or Christmas, which was in December. And I think, what do I want to inherit? And, um, you know, that, that is a factor that does creep in. But God says, God says, one day, son, this will all be yours. The Bible says, no eye has seen, about heaven, No eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And he says to us, one day, my daughter, this will all be yours. Lavish. And then God blesses us freely. He says in verse 6, he talks about his glorious grace freely gifted to us. Verse 7, the riches of his grace. Grace literally means generosity or gift. The word in Greek is charis, charis, from which we get our word charity. And what he gives us is free. It's all free. Heaven is free to us. How much does it cost, this salvation? Nothing is free. How much does redemption cost us? Nothing is free. How much does adoption cost us? Nothing absolutely free. How much does it cost to get into heaven? Nothing absolutely free. All these blessings, spiritual blessings in heavenly realms are free. They're gratis. Nada, nothing, now to pay. God's blessing was given to us before we were born. Everything here, the aorist is in the past tense. The aorist in the Greek literally means already. It's already given. It's already done. It's already laid up for us. We're already chosen. We're already blessed. Jesus already died for us. He already paid for our sins. And so there's nothing transactional in this. It's not conditional. God doesn't need our persuade, need persuading or impressing. We don't come to him with stuff and say, you know, please God, will you forgive me on the basis of this? There's nothing we can bring. We come empty-handed, and he's got arms full of blessing. All we need to do, actually, is to come. But some of us struggle with this idea of grace. We struggle to receive it, so we think we've got to impress God, and we struggle to give it, and we, we, you know, put pressure on others. I I was writing this in a coffee shop this week, and um, I was typing away grace, and I thought, oh, I need an illustration of grace. And I sort of prayed, and Lord, I need an illustration of grace. And I went through my brain and didn't find anything in it to do with grace. And suddenly a couple came in, a couple of postgrads, and they sat down at this table, and they opened up their laptops, and they opened up their bags, and they got their phone, put the music on, and... and um, I thought, oh, they'll go and buy a cup of tea in a minute, and they didn't. Five minutes went by. I, I thought, and I'm writing about grace, and I'm looking at them, and 10 minutes went by, they didn't buy out, and 20 minutes went by, they didn't buy any. I thought, something's wrong here. What do they think this is, free? They've, they've got free Wi-Fi, free heating, free seat. Someone could be there paying for it. And indeed, I'm here having paid for my seat and my almond croissant. And I felt really indignant in a righteous way because I was feeling for the owner of it, Ori. And then, that's his name. And then the Lord, I, I thought, I'm going to say something to them. I'm going to say, Oi, this is out of order. Get and pay or get out of here but it's not my shop. And I thought, I probably shouldn't do that. I'm a vicar and they might come to all day, so I better not. And then I thought, I'm just going to go and tell the owner, do you, do you allow this? And I was indignant that they were getting something for nothing. And then the Lord spoke to me. He said, chill out, Simon, for peace. <laughs> he said, it's grace. Actually, grace would have been them being brought free drinks and free almond croissants. But that's what God does with us. He gives us a seat at the table. 
that's completely laden with all these wonderful things. And he says, tuck in. And there's more where that came from, lad. And we pay nothing for it. And then God's blessings need receiving. God lays the table, but he doesn't force feed us. We need to say yes to the God who's already said yes to us. Let's have a look, verse 13. He says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and when you believed in Jesus, you were sealed by the Spirit, the deposit guaranteeing you your inheritance until that redemption. There was a hearing and a believing and then a sealing. We've got to hear. We've got to believe. And then we've got to receive. They're not conditions. They are sort of prerequisites. Without that, we can't get all that God has got to give us. It says in verse 11, Paul writes, we were the first to hope in Christ. He's saying, we put our trust in Jesus. We put our trust in the gospel. We said yes to the God who says yes to us in Christ Jesus. And then what did they do? Having met Jesus, having been sealed, they went out and told others. We then come to verse 13 and he says, you, first of all, we, Paul talking about himself and the apostles. Then he says, you, he listened to the gospel and believed. Why? Because Paul had gone to them and shared with them what he had received. This church has been here over a thousand years. Underneath where you're sat, there are saints are buried. Dozens and dozens of them, all buried under the middle of this church, all with their feet this end, their heads that, and ready to rise and face east when Jesus returns. Over a thousand years, generation after generation after generation, one family handing it down to the next family, to the next family, to the next family, one people to another people. They didn't keep it, those Saxons buried under here didn't keep it to themselves. They had heard, they had hoped, they had believed, they would trusted, they would received Christ. They knew what it was to experience something of these beautiful spiritual blessings and they wanted to give it away. And they told the next generation. They told the next, they told the next, they told the next, they told the next. And here we are in St. Aldate's and it's come to us. What are we going to do about it? I'm going to keep it to ourselves and consume it. Or we who have hoped, are we going to be those who go to others, to our Ephesus, as it were, and tell our families and our friends and our work colleagues and our communities and the people we commute with on the train or the bus or we meet online or wherever and say, can I tell you something about the hope I have? You know, people live in desperation. There's got to be more than this. And what is the more? We've got it. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian today because someone told me. If they hadn't have done, I might not have been. But I was in a pub in Nailsey, in the West Country, where the Wurzels came from. I was in a pub, outside of which is a bronze statue to the Wurzels. And I said to a, a young lady, something like, do you want to come with me and I'll show you the way to heaven? <laughs> On a Friday night. And she said, you need God. And I freaked out. I walked out. I sat in the subway, lit a fag, and I was shaking because I did need God. Shortly after, I went to give money to a busker in Bristol. I'd been up watching the boat races. and I went to give money. He said, I don't want your money. I want to tell you something. You can't keep running from God. I nearly smacked him. <laughs> I was then in the car. We were driving back to Nailsley. I had a row with my mate. I said, stop the car. I got out. I was outside the church. I went in, and a man called John Simons, who currently has been in intensive care for surgery, he's 90, he's a dear old man, he preached about the love of God. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And an appeal was made, and I went and said, yes, I believe and I will receive. And the Spirit came into my life, and I never got over it. That was 39 years ago. I'm a Christian because someone told me. You're a Christian because someone prayed and someone shared. 
And we've got Alpha coming up. Who are you going to share with? Who are you going to invite? Who are you going to pray for? That's what we're about. The blessings have been laid up, but they need to be received. And they're received on the basis of hearing and saying yes to God's yes. But how can they hear if someone doesn't tell them? And who's going to tell them unless it's those who knows? Those who know. Paul says, you listened. And the question is, who next is to listen? You listen, but who else is to listen? Who do you know who needs? And then lastly, God blesses us intentionally. Verse 9, it says, according to his good pleasure and will. You see that? It pleased him, and it's something he willed. Verse 11, we're predestined according to the plan of him who works out all things according to the purpose of his will. He purposed it. He willed it. It pleased him. It was according to him. This is God's economy. This is God's doing. This is God's plan. And being welcomed into his family and chosen and adopted and forgiven and redeemed. This is not an accident of birth. It's not random. It's not chaos. It's God's desire. And it's all focused and funneled through God in Christ Jesus dying for us at the cross. Paying the price for our sins. Rising again to show that his death was acceptable and death that comes through sin was defeated and ascending into heaven and getting it ready for us. But God willed it. God wanted it. God willed you. God wanted you. And not just you, your friends and your family and your neighbours and the people you can't stand and you turn your nose up and the annoying people at work and so on. I don't know if you watch the Jason Bourne trilogy. I love all that stuff. And uh, in one of them, Bourne Supremacy, Nikki. Uh, in the CIA, one of the sort of people controlling the operatives, they say, oh, Jason Bourne, they did something. They said, oh, he's made a mistake. And she says, it's not a mistake. They don't make mistakes. They don't do random. There's always an objective. And God didn't make a mistake. And God doesn't do random. And God always has an ob object and an objective, his purpose and his will. And that was to bless us with heaven and to bring us into his family. I need to finish. My old dad, what a beautiful man he is. I'm a Christian because he prayed and someone else shared. He is getting old and he's beginning to get confused at times with some of his words. But he's really sorry, he's become really sentimental in his old age. And he wrote to me the other day, he said, Son, you were God's gift to us from the moment you were conceived, and I remember it well. <laughs> I mean, he meant born, but I think he meant born. I just thought, what? What a dear old man. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Son, you were God's gift to us from the moment you were conceived, and I remember it well. I thought, no, you don't. But, but we, and you were God's gift, from before you were conceived. And he remembered it well. And he saw you from afar. He saw you from all eternity. And he willed to bring you into his family and to bless you with every spiritual blessing. Amen. <laughs>